the Schneider Trophy, most coveted air award of the 1920s and 30s. Supermarine, British challengers, already winners in 22, shook the world in 1925 with R.J. Mitchell's revolutionary Supermarine 4 monoplane. In 1927, the S-5, piloted by Flight Lieutenant Webster, roared to success, winning the trophy at 281 miles an hour. R.J. Mitchell's magnificent design for these early aircraft was so far ahead of its time that we can already discern the clean, fast lines of the Spitfire, which wasn't destined to appear for another nine years. In 1929, the S-6, powered by a 1900 horsepower Rolls-Royce engine and piloted by Flying Officer Waghorn, won the trophy at 328 miles an hour. Squadron leader Allabauer, leader of the high-speed flight, raised the speed record to 357 miles an hour with the S-6 a few days later. In 1931, piloting an S-6B at 340 miles an hour, Flight Lieutenant Boothman won the Schneider race for the third successive time. So the trophy was gained by Britain in perpetuity. Obviously, supermarine design and Rolls-Royce engines formed the perfect speed combination. In the same year and again with the S-6B, Flight Lieutenant Stainforth set up a new world record of 407 miles an hour. The name supermarine had become synonymous with speed. R.J. Mitchell then applied experience of single-seater racing seaplanes to his final masterpiece, a fighter land plane for the Royal Air Force. On March the 5th, 1936, the first of the immortal Spitfires took the air. But alas, the designer never lived to see them go into squadron service to become the greatest fighting aircraft of all time. Mercifully, Joe Smith had worked so closely with R.J. Mitchell that he could immediately take over as design chief and ensure continued development of the redoubtable Spitfire. The bombing of Britain had scattered Spitfire production all over the country, but in spite of this, 22,000 Spitfires were built. They made over 890,000 sorties, flown not only by the RAF, but by pilots of all the free nations of the world. Carrier-borne aircraft must take second place in performance to land-based fighters was disproved in 1941 by the appearance of the Seafire, naval version of the Spitfire. The flying bomb was now attacking Britain and the supremely controllable Spitfire assumed a new role. Now, end of a momentous chapter in the story of our fighter aircraft, the Seafire 47, last of the Spitfire line. Another page in the annals of achievement in the air is turned, and we move on. 1945, the Spiteful, a new aeroplane with redesigned wings, achieved the remarkable speed of 494 miles an hour but the valuable experience gained from this fast flying aircraft was to be carried still further forward. For well, there's always something new, Supermarine Design Headquarters were already developing a sweeping change
to jet power. The accumulated know-how of 30 years was concentrated on this transition. But design had always to keep ahead of demand. As engine power enabled us to approach the speed of sound, aircraft had to remain as manageable for the ordinary pilot as earlier supermarines had been. July 1946, the attacker, supermarine's first jet fighter, retaining some continuity of design, but with a Rolls-Royce Neen turbojet, tested by Geoffrey Quill. In 1948, another famous test pilot, Mike Lithgow, flying the attacker with a full military load in bad visibility, established an international 100-kilometer closed-circuit record of over 564 miles an hour. In spite of higher landing speeds, the attacker, with additional armament, was successfully adapted to the operating limitations of carrier-borne aircraft. The carrier trials were an undoubted success. Supermarine and naval pilots were agreed on the remarkable deck landing qualities of this record-breaking aircraft. Supermarine, once makers of racing seaplanes and then the immortal Spitfire, now protect the seas with the Navy's first operational jet fighter. of R.J. Mitchell with the realization of Joe Smith and the supermarine staff. Continuous development is maintained into the jet age. The demand is never-ending for yet more rapid climb, greater speeds, altitude and maneuverability. The pedigree of design remains, an uninterrupted lineage from the first to the new. line for the Navy was the 508, a twin-engine fighter with a thin straight wing and butterfly tail unit, the plane which startled spectators at the Farnborough display on August the 5th, 1951. trials were carried out by Mike Lithgow on HMS Eagle, and once again, Supermarine brought the air arm of the Royal Navy up to date as a powerful striking force. Meanwhile, with attacker fuselage and power plant, but with swept back wings, the Type 510 was evolved for experiment. For the second time, the trend of supermarine design was towards a land-based adaptation. Some worthy successor to the Spitfire was sought. Five was a progressive development of the 510, again with a redesigned wing and nose wheel undercarriage. Important modifications increased performance and firepower, and hopes continued to rise as the new aircraft started on its trial.
refinements, adjustments, improvements, yet continuity in design. The Swift Mark I, the first of the new. The sudden need of the Royal Air Force and our allies was for a fighter aircraft with speed in excess of 650 miles an hour and a ceiling about 50,000 feet to intercept atom bombers. The Swift Mark I takes to the sky. From Schneider Trophy through Spitfire, Seafire, Spiteful, Attacker to the graceful Swift. Supermarine Swift Mark I, test pilot David Morgan set up a London to Brussels speed record early in 1953, a distance of 200 miles in 18 minutes. the instantaneous success of the first of the Swift line was satisfying, there could be no pause in development. At Supermarine headquarters, the staff continued to press forward under Joe Smith. And here, developed from the 508, this new twin jet fighter, to be known as the Supermarine 525, shows the shape of things to come. The Duke of Edinburgh meets the pilots who tested and proved each new design. Quill, Lisko, Cahoon, Morgan, Horn, and Judge. Having established a new record of 19 and a half minutes from London to Paris in the Swift 4, it was decided to attack the world speed record in the same aircraft. And so Mike Lithgow took this machine, a standard aircraft, to Tripoli for reasons which he explains himself. The reason for taking the Swift to North Africa is well known. In a warm climate, the speed of sound is higher and hence the tremendous drag associated with flight at near sonic speeds is delayed. Accompanied by an attacker flown by Les Cahoon as safety aircraft, I left England on September the 22nd, stopping at Nice and Tunis to refuel and arriving at Tripoli without incident the same evening. Further three days before the timing equipment was ready and everything was set for the first series of practice runs. These first runs, two in each direction at a height of about 50 feet, resulted in an average speed of 735 miles an hour in spite of some technical trouble with the aircraft. We hoped soon to put these right and reach our target of 740 miles an hour, but it was not to be. Next day, we learned that the timing equipment was giving trouble, and to cut a long story short, we were eventually forced to claim this speed as the new record. size had been achieved, and that was to demonstrate that this standard production Swift was right in front as regards performance. This is, and always has been, the most important single attribute of a fighter aircraft. The speed of the trial runs was officially established as a world record. From 1927, at 281 miles an hour, to 1953, 735.7 miles an hour. March the 4th, 1954, the 
first squadron of Supermarine Swifts joined the Royal Air Force, ready to serve and ready to add to the glorious history of fighter aircraft as befits direct descendants of the immortal Spitfire, the first of the new.